beginning with Khalil Andani. Uh, he holds a PhD in Islamic studies from Harvard University, Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization, and serves as an assistant professor of religion at Augustana College. His dissertation in Revelation in Islam, Quranic, Sunni, and Shi'i's Ismaili perspectives was awarded best PhD dissertation of the year by the Foundation for Iranian Studies in 2020. His first book project based on his this dissertation will be an analytical and historical investigation of Muslim theologies of revelation in the formative and classical periods of Islam. His publications include articles in Oxford Journal of Islamic Studies, Brill Journal of Sufi Studies, Religious, Religion Compass, Journal of Islamic and Muslim Studies, chapters in the Oxford Handbook of Islamic Philosophy, Deconstructing Islamic Studies, Global Critical Philosophy of Religion, and the Rutledge Companion to the Quran. Khalil also maintains an active social media presence on Twitter, YouTube, and academia.edu, where he makes this scholarship available to wider non-academic audiences. So you can all find them there as well. So uh, let me uh, begin by saying it is a great honor to be participating in this uh, really unique conference with everybody here. I see all these familiar faces, both from my uh, academic and uh, other aspects of life here on the participant list. So it's good to see you all. Thank you to uh, Dr. Mohammed Farooq and Professor Mohammed Rustam for putting this conference together. And thank you to the panel chairs, especially uh, Professor uh, May Sami uh, for being here. Um, what, I, what really excited me about the conference is that this is not just a what I would call an academic journalism conference, right? We were not asked to pick out some philosopher from a thousand years ago and just do a reporting on their beliefs. Uh, we were instead asked to uh, play the role of Muslim uh, philosophers or Muslim thinkers uh, in and of ourselves and creatively draw on the Islamic intellectual and spiritual traditions to address you know the odyssey the problem of evil and whatnot so this is a different sort of thing right a lot of us are not formally trained in constructive work although we've always been wanting to do constructive work uh, and these conferences give finally give us the opportunity to do that right within an academic collegial context so i'm very thankful to the organizers for for, for having the vision right to do this uh, very thankful. And it's a privilege for me to, to be involved in this. Uh, and, and frankly, it's something that I've been doing a little bit differently is to venture into constructive territory. And what, I, what do I mean, mean by constructive, right? By constructive, we mean more than just being descriptive. Most of what we do in this field is we just describe what other people believe, right? And we like add our, our like fancy color commentary to it. Uh, and, and usually a descriptive thesis is very nuances. So-and-so believes this for X reason, uh, and we make no judgment over whether we think it makes sense or not. But by constructive, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to actually um, present to you what I believe drawing on these materials. Uh, and you may agree, right, or you may disagree, or, or you, know, you may throw tomatoes virtually at me and chase me out of the hall. It doesn't matter. Uh, that's the beauty of this. So uh, what I decided to do is um, I looked at contemporary literature on theodicy, and what you often find is this classical sort of problem of evil that's presented in this way. What is a problem of evil in summary? Uh, and this is not a very sophisticated presentation of it, but um, the problem of evil basically says that given the way the world is right now, right, or it has ever been, given the fact that evil does exist in our world, it seems to be impossible that God is all powerful, all knowing and all good simultaneously. Why? Well, if God is all powerful, uh, he's capable of getting rid of evil. Um, and if God is all knowing, he knows that there's evil in the world. And if God is all good, he wants to remove evil from the world. And yet, if you just look around today, uh, what do we see? Well, we see pandemics, we see oppression, we see injustice, uh, we see poverty, uh, we see torture, 
Uh, we see death, disease, decay. We see all sorts of evils, corruptions, deficiencies, and so on. So the, the, according to this problem of evil, which you'll find stated in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, for example, um, if God is capable of removing the evil, if he knows this evil exists, uh, and if he's all good, he wants to get rid of this evil, and yet here we are. He didn't do it. Uh, and the argument goes that therefore God, for an inexplicable reason, has created a cosmos full of natural and volitional evil, uh, which seems to go against his great making properties. At least that's the way the problem is presented. Now, of course, there are solutions. People have proposed solutions to this problem. Um, some popular ones are soul making, which we'll talk about. Uh, the free will defense, you know, if people have free will, they will have to be able to commit evil. Uh, some have said that this universe is the best possible world, uh, which sometimes seems tempting until, you know, you watch the news. Um, uh, other people talk about natural law and so on. So, so the, the people have given defenses. Um, so here's where I'm coming at it. All right, so I, and I, may, I make no secret about this anymore, uh, I consider myself a Muslim uh, Neoplatonist, okay? I actually hold personally to a Neoplatonic worldview, okay? Which is a worldview some, something like this. There are, of course, many versions of this that one could take, but I'm a Muslim Neoplatonist myself. Uh, Confessionally, I am within the Ismaili Muslim tradition of Islam. But as people know, uh, Islamic Neoplatonism is a very big tent. And this is a point that I made last week in a certain debate that I had uh, with a certain Salafi person. So where I'm getting, where, where I'm approaching this is that I looked at the contemporary problem of evil that I just stated. And I believe that Islamic Neoplatonism, whether in the Ismaili form of it or at the Avicennan form or the Southerian form, uh, I believe Islamic Neoplatonism has better metaphysical and spiritual resources to address the problem of evil. And it certainly has better resources than what we have heard from the Sunni Kalam tradition, the scholastic tradition of the Christian uh, philosophers, as well as modern analytic theologies. Uh, that, that is my contention. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw on the Ismaili Muslim Neoplatonic uh, corpus, fr namely from uh, three major Ismaili thinkers, Asijistani, Nasser al-Khosro, and Nasir al-Din Tusi, as well as um, some things that the recent Ismaili imams have said. And I'm going to construct an Islamic theodicy that is an answer to the problem of evil uh, that... Um, well, in some sense, it's new. In some sense, it's not really new. I would say everything I'm saying is already embedded in, in books from a thousand years ago. But when you pick up a classical Islamic text, there is no special chapter called the problem of evil, right? Uh, because this was, uh, it's been said by Dr. Nasser, Professor Nasser and others that the problem of evil as we know it today was not like a central concern, it seems, for a lot of the Islamic uh, philosophical tradition. Instead, they dealt with the similar question under the section of divine providence, for example. So in some sense, what I'm saying is not new. In another sense, it is new. All right. So uh, let us address it then. So firstly, we need to ask, in Islamic Neoplatonism and in the Smiley tradition generally, what is the notion of creation that we have? Uh, and th already here, we have a partial answer to the problem of evil in its contemporary formulations. So the problem of evil today assumes that God directly created this physical universe with all of its imperfections. Many people, many theists just assume that is how things happen. God directly creates the physical, spatio-temporal, you know, atomic universe that we live in. OK, uh, in the Muslim Neoplatonic tradition, this is not accurate. Rather, in the Neoplatonic tradition, uh, what God directly creates is not the physical universe. Rather, God directly creates a perfect creation. Now, drawing on the Ismaili tradition, let me just sketch this out, because this is already part of the solution to the problem of evil. So first, in the Ismaili tradition, like many other philosophical uh, Sufi type traditions, God is absolutely simple. So God does not contain any multiplicity. 
okay? God does not contain real distinct attributes. The one way of putting this is that in the Neoplatonic tradition, God's omniscience is not numerically distinct from God's omnipotence, okay? So God's attribute of power and God's attribute of knowledge are not really distinct uh, in this tradition. In fact, God is absolutely simple reality, and you cannot really speak of God's power and God's knowledge as distinct attributes or distinct realities when you're talking about God. It's just a category error. So God is absolutely simple, and it follows logically from God's absolute simplicity that the uh, action of God, okay, what comes from God, the creative action of God, the creative will of God, the divine action can only be one, okay? So from God, there only comes a single divine action, not multiple divine actions. If multiple divine actions issue from God, it would necessitate that there is multiplicity within the divine essence, but that's not possible. Okay, if there was multiplicity within the divine essence, the divine essence would be composite. It would be composed of these multiple aspects. And whatever is composite is dependent on its parts for its subsistence or its existence. But because God is independent, right? God is independent. The independence or the samadhiya of God completely precludes any multiplicity being in God. So if God is absolutely simple, then the direct action of God must be just one act, not many acts. Now, what is this direct action of God? Well, the Ismailis refer to God's action, his single action, as an act of will, okay? An act of will. And this act of will that issues from God, that proceeds from God or emanates from God, uh, it is eternal. Because God doesn't change. It's not like God shifts from not willing to willing. So God eternally is willing. And the act of will that comes from God is an eternal action. Furthermore, the Ismailis, as well as the Evacenans and the Southerians maintain, that the will of God, which is an action, uh, is pure goodness. There's no deficiency in the will of God. It's, it's the best act that there could be. Uh, and God's will, unlike our will, God's will does not look at a menu of options and then pick one thing from the menu. Rather, the will of God is essentially undivided and single. Okay, It, it must be necessarily directed toward pure goodness. Okay, So God's will is pure goodness. So we have God, and according to Abu Yaqub Sijistani, the Ismaili philosopher, uh, God is called, he refers to God as the perfectly generous, okay? This is not an attribute of essence, this is an attribute of action. Why is God called the perfectly generous? Because God's single act of will is perfect goodness, okay? This is how Sijistani explains it, and it cannot be any other way. Uh, so in a sense, God's act of will okay, which is his creative action, is necessary. It's necessitated by God's own essence. So God's act of will is pure goodness. And what this act of will brings into existence, because the act of will is pure goodness, what it produces is a perfect essence or a perfect substance. Okay, why does God produce a perfect substance? Because his action is perfect. If the action has no deficiency, then the result is something perfect. So God's act of will, which is eternal, produces a perfect substance. And what happens, and this gets a bit complicated in the text, but from what I've been able to gather, God's perfect action produces a perfect essence, and together, the divine action and the substance that it produces together they compose or they produce the first creation, which is the perfect creation. What is this perfect creation? The perfect creation is the conjunction of God's perfect will and a perfect substance 
that that will brings into being. And together, the perfect will and the perfect essence constitute the first creation, which is called the first intellect within the Neoplatonic tradition. Uh, so the way Sijistani puts it is that God is perfectly generous. His will, or which is his action, is perfectly good, perfect goodness, and therefore the first creation is a perfect creation. Okay, so this is the first point. And already we have actually dealt with one part of the problem of evil. Because in our solution to the problem of evil, God directly creates a perfectly good creation. There is no evil within the first intellect. The first intellect is the best substance, the best creation that could possibly be brought into being by God. And the first, the first intellect is eternal and uh, it glows with goodness, you could say, okay, because it's been directly produced by God. So that's the sort of the first point. And it follows from the first point that the first intellect is wholly good and it has no evil. Okay, it's the very essence of goodness. It's perfect. Uh, it's a perfect creation. Uh, and because it's fully good and fully perfect, in the first intellect, there is no um, suffering. There is no sadness. Uh, we are told in many texts, the first intellect is eternally in a state of absolute bliss and happiness. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. And this is sort of like a diagram of the first intellect that... Uh, the Ismaili thinker Hamid al Kermani uh, has forwarded in his writing. So the first intellect has all these attributes of perfection, uh, and it is what God directly creates. And again, it's an eternal creation. So Abu Yaqub al-Sijistani talks about how in the first intellect there is no evil. Uh, technically speaking, for Sijistani and the Ismailis, God, the originator, is above good and evil, okay? and good would be defined as the first creation. Okay, so the first intellect becomes the standard of what we consider to be good, okay? When you say something is good, something is better, you're actually appealing, not perhaps unknowingly, to the first intellect. The first intellect is the standard setter for what is good. So it is pure goodness. Similarly, Nasser the Tusi tells us that absolute goodness is absolute perfection. The first intellect is absolute perfection. God can do no less than create absolute perfection. Therefore, the first intellect is absolute goodness. So this is where the concept of good comes from. Okay, it's rooted ontologically in this idea of the first intellect. So already here, the first response to the problem of evil is that God does not directly create evil. God directly creates pure goodness and nothing else, okay? So we've already sort of got out, we already canceled out some of the, the contemporary problem of evil by, by this type of Neoplatonic understanding. Um, nevertheless, right, uh, you'll still, you're probably looking outside and you're probably are still seeing, you know, evil or, or corruption or deficiency outside your window. So then the question is, well, okay, great. Um, why do we live in a universe where clearly, clearly there is evil if God only directly creates the first intellect? All right, so let's continue then. So the first intellect is a perfect creation, but the first intellect is not God. That has some impact on our cosmology. Since the first intellect is not God, the first intellect cannot create another first intellect. In other words, the perfect creation, because it is a creation, cannot make another perfect creation. Only God can create a perfect creation. So the first intellect does have creative power, it is productive, but because it is a creation, it is unable to make something exactly like itself. Okay, this is just a sort of metaphysical law. Uh, if the first intellect could create another creation that's exactly like itself, the first intellect would be God. It would be able to sustain its own existence independent of God. But the first intellect 
lacks ontological independence. The first intellect depends on God, even though it's a perfect creation, it depends on God. So it does not have the power to make another first intellect. So the first intellect does create its own effect. It does do that. It has creative power and it creates the best possible substance that it could make, which is not perfect, okay? The first intellect creates something called the universal soul. And the universal soul is not perfect. Why? Because the first intellect does not have the power to create another perfect being. Uh, the universal soul is very close to perfection, but it's not perfect. Uh, the way that smileys talk about it is they say the universal soul is perfect in potentiality, but imperfect or deficient in, act in actuality. Why? Because it is not the direct creation of God. It is the direct effect of the first intellect. Now, this is important to note because this is, metaphysically speaking, the root of evil or what we call evil, okay? Evil takes root, metaphysically, in the substance of the universal soul. Why? Because the universal soul, compared to the first intellect, which is perfection, the universal soul is deficient and imperfect. This relative imperfection is what I call the metaphysical root of evil within this Neoplatonic framework, okay? So what I've tried to do here is I've tried to explain how we get good, which is the first intellect. Now I'm trying to show you how we get evil. Why does evil exist, okay? Evil exists because the universal soul exists and the universal soul is imperfect because it has not been directly created by God. So evil then is not an essence, it is what you call an accident. Evil is imperfection, privation, deficiency, which arises downstream in the causal chain. So again, God does not directly create the, the universal soul. So God is not directly responsible for the existence of evil within the universal soul. Nevertheless, evil cannot be avoided, okay? Evil is unavoidable. If you're going to have a chain of causes and effects, because only God can make a perfect creation, any creation that is made by something other than God will contain imperfection and you will therefore have evil. So evil uh, is an accident that cannot be avoided within this framework. That's why there's evil. This is sort of similar to Professor Nasser's understanding, right? Which he does in a much more sort of simplified way. Uh, but the existence of evil in the sense of imperfection cannot be avoided, basically. Uh, so Tusi and other Ismailis take you, they, they take this privative understanding of evil, right? Evil is not an essence. Evil is the absence of good. It's imperfection, it's deficiency, and so on. Uh, and that deficiency, what we call evil, first takes root in the universal soul. It does not take root in the first intellect. So let us continue then. So what happens? Well, in Ismaili cosmology, the universal soul recognizes that the first intellect is perfect and that, that she, sometimes they, they use the feminine to talk about the universal soul. The universal soul also recognizes that she herself is imperfect, okay? So the universal soul directly recognizes and confronts this relative evil within itself, okay? It knows that, she, or she knows that she's imperfect. And that recognition is very important. Uh, there's a direct acknowledgement of imperfection on the part of the universal soul. What does that lead to? Well, after, and this is not happening in time, this is happening sort of logically speaking, after the universal soul recognizes her own imperfection, okay, the, this so-called evil within herself, after that, she is prompted to seek perfection. This is a very important point, right? It is the direct experience of internal evil that causes the universal soul to seek good. And how does it seek out this perfection? Right? It wants to become perfect. Well, it creates. It creates what we call the cosmos. Uh, and how does it create? Why does, why, why does it create a physical cosmos? Well, as Nasser the Tusi and many people explain, uh, the physical universe is a composite of matter and form. 
okay, of pure, of pure receptivity, as well as qualities, reflected qualities of perfection, that's form. Why? Why does it have matter and form? Well, according to Nasir then Tusi, and I've tried to diagram it for you, the potential perfection of the universal soul is the cause of intelligible form. These are the qualities of perfection. But the deficiency within the universal soul is the cause of prime matter, which is a purely receptive substance that can receive form in, a, in an incomplete way. So the universal soul creates out of its own resources. And because the universal soul is a mixture of perfection and imperfection, the universe that we live in is a mixture of perfection and imperfection. In other words, the universe that we live in has good and evil because the direct producer of our universe, namely the universal soul, is itself or herself a mixture of good and evil. That's why we have natural evil within our universe. This is why our universe is not perfect. Our universe is not perfect because our universe is the manifestation of an attempt by the universal soul to reach perfection. So our cosmos is in a perpetual state of becoming, okay? It's on the road toward perfection, but it's not there yet. That's why there's natural evil. Now, our cosmos is the best possible world that the universal soul can create, okay? It's the best, so to, to put it colloquially, the universal soul is really trying its best, okay? This is the best that it can do. The best that it can do is produce our universe with all the corruption and death and decay that our universe has. But look, our universe is also very beautiful, right? I mean, you can just go outside, take a walk in a forest, uh, go visit some, some natural sites. The universe is also full of beauty. Uh, it has all the hallmarks of something that's well-designed as well, right? We have many design arguments showing that. So our universe has perfection and imperfection. It's the best possible universe that the universal soul could create, but it's also the lowest possible level of existence. And I think that was mentioned on Monday. So this is why there's natural evil in the universe, okay? Why, why things like die, things get corrupt. This is why we have pandemics. This is why we have earthquakes and mudslides. This is why death exists. The universal soul cannot do any better, okay? It's trying its best. So let's, let's cut her some slack. All right, so... Um, what the universal soul also creates, and I'm sort of running low on time, I'll speed up, but what the universal soul creates through creating the universe is it produces individual souls. And what the universal soul is able to do throughout this cosmic process is it produces two types of individual souls, of human souls. Some human souls, most human souls that it makes are imperfect. Okay, so it creates a spectrum of human souls. Some souls are very evil. Some are sort of in between. Some are more good than more evil. But also the universal soul is able to create a few perfect souls. Okay, so it does accomplish its goal of producing perfection by way of creating souls. So you end up with like a hierarchy of things in the cosmos. All right. And this hierarchy manifests gradually. It takes time to see all this stuff. Okay. So something like the evolutionary process is what you'd expect in a cosmos that's created by the universal soul. So eventually the universal soul does accomplish its goal. It does create perfect human souls. And all of the rest of us who may be imperfect right now, we are all potentially perfect. We can journey toward perfection. Okay, so we all have the ability to become better. Okay, all souls have the ability, all human souls have the ability to reflect the perfection of the first intellect. Some souls are created already at that level. These are the souls of the prophets and the imams. The rest of us are not created at that level, but we are invited to come to that level, right? The whole purpose of religion is almost like a factory to turn imperfect souls into perfect souls. So we all have that potential. Uh, and we are actually imitating the universal soul. It is seeking perfection by creating everything, right? And we are microcosms of it and we are seeking perfection. So then 
this leads to this issue of, well, the evil within the cosmos, can that help us achieve perfection? Uh, and in this tradition, the answer is yes. Uh, let us remember that the universal soul, okay, sought perfection only after recognizing her own imperfection. In other words, before the universal soul tries to seek perfection, it has to experience its own imperfection. We repeat that process, okay? We will experience evil either within ourselves or externally. And what we can do is just like the universal soul experienced its own evil and it sought out the good, our experience of evil can prompt us to seek out the good, whether that evil is within us or outside of us. So we must correctly interpret our experience of evil. This is what I think the tradition would say. So here we have a quote from Nasir Dhan uh, in his Ismaili work. And he actually tells us that all of these disasters and misfortunes and calamities, all of these things from a particular angle are actually a form of divine mercy. And what these calamities and natural evils do for us is it prevents the people of the world, it prevents human beings from being overtaken by hubris and by pride. In other words, our experience of evil in the cosmos can actually prompt us towards seeking the good, right? So this is what you would call a soul building theodicy, right? So not only have I tried to explain why we have evil in the cosmos, but I'm trying to explain how the evil within the universe can serve a good purpose as long as it's interpreted correctly. And what Tusi says here is that these, this is, these um, hardships of life, they are there to polish the soul. Okay, the soul can be polished by experiencing suffering and evil, as long as it interprets those properly. So Tusi further says that all of this experience of suffering can melt the soul, right? It can lead to spiritual transformation. So this evil within the cosmos can serve a good purpose. Now, I have a contemporary statement from Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah, Aga Khan III, this is the 48th Imam of the Nizari Ismailis. And he was once asked by his community, why doesn't the Imam remove all the evil from the world? Why don't you, like literally they asked him, why don't you just like wave your hand and make it all go away? And the Imam actually said that if the Imam were to remove all the evil from the world, uh, this world would not be any different from the hereafter. And he went on to explain that humans should not be dismayed by the difficulties and sufferings that befall him in this world. He should be pleased by such natural sufferings because man's sins are washed away and the soul is released from sins through all the suffering that we experience. And he said, the Imam said, by enduring all these sufferings and difficulties, which are preordained, the soul becomes pure. Now, the Imam did say that there are some illnesses and some sufferings which come as a result of your own carelessness, okay? So some evil we just bring upon ourselves, right? Uh, you live an unhealthy life and then you have health problems. That's sort of our fault, right? You make dumb decisions. That's our fault. So the Imam of the time of the Ismailis has distinguished between what you could call cosmically ordained evil and evil due to human negligence. Uh, and he's saying that any, anything that is coming on you due to your carelessness, that is not going to wash your sins away. Uh, the final note I'll, I'll say is that uh, Nasir Dhan Tusi, uh, 800 years ago, as well as Aga Khan III, the recent Ismaili Imam, they have also said that human beings should take a optimistic perspective toward existence. So according to Nasir Dhan Tusi, and this is my last slide, the acts of God appear differently to each person depending on their spiritual level. So for one type of person, everything that happens in life, which is the act of God ultimately, is tyranny, okay? But for another type of person, everything that God does, everything that happens is justice. But for another type of person, everything that comes from God is a grace. And finally, for uh, the person at the highest level, everything that comes from God is mercy, okay? So whether there really is evil in this world or not is also going to depend on your spiritual perspective. 
Um, we have some contemporary advice given by uh, Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah Aga Khan III, which this was written probably like 60, 70, you know, 70 years ago, maybe more, but it reads a lot like what has become popular today in books by Eckhart Tolle and people like that. So what Aga Khan III has said is that you need to learn to desire the thing that happens and don't try to mold events to your desire. So he's saying, look, you, if whatever happens, you just have to accept it now. You have to put yourself in harmony with the way things actually are. Uh, he has also said that if you're able to do this, you should seek communion with that eternal reality that I call Allah and you call God. So the twin problem of existence is to be entirely yourself and altogether at one with the eternal. How do you do that? By bringing yourself in harmony with the way things are. That's what the Imam is talking about. So what the Imam is basically saying is that once something has happened, it's already happened, right? He's not articulating a theology of passivity, but what he's saying is that once something has already happened to you, the best response is to interpret that happening as the best possible thing that could happen. That's what the Imam is saying here, right? Uh, so this is a, a orientation of acceptance, right? Of tawakkul, for example, of relying on God, of trusting on God that, look, whatever happened, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. And what I see happening here is that uh, Aga Khan III is sort of translating a lot of this metaphysics that I've been talking about, right? This is the best possible world, but it's the lowest possible world. And nevertheless, it's still the best possible world. How do you translate that into a personal orientation toward reality? So let me uh, conclude then very quickly. Um, I've tried to pr produce a solution to the problem of evil, the contemporary problem of evil, by drawing on the Neoplatonic tradition. So I'll just go back to this earlier slide and summarize what I've done. So my first solution to the problem of evil was to say that in Islamic Neoplatonism, and I've used the Ismaili version, okay? But if you are a follower of Ibn Sina, you could do the same thing that I did. If you're a follower of Ibn Arabi, you could do the same thing that I did. If you follow Mullah Sadra, you could do the same thing. So within the Neoplatonic tradition, the first solution is that God directly created a perfect creation, the first intellect. God never directly created evil. So any charge that an all-knowing, all-good God has directly created evil goes out the window. OK, and the second thing I said is that the existence of evil, which happens downstream, OK, it is a byproduct of there being any creation. But the existence of evil within the universal soul prompted the universal soul to seek out good. OK, so evil, even though it exists, properly interpreted, evil should be the impetus or the occasion for someone or something to seek goodness. If that is true for the universal soul, it's also true for the individual soul. So the correct interpretation of evil as we experience it is that we accept that this is happening to us and we recognize that evil is imperfection. And if imperfection exists, then perfection exists and that we should strive to seek perfection after confronting imperfection. And I'll end with a quote from Aga Khan III where he says, Struggle is the meaning of life. Victory or defeat is within the hands of God, but man's struggle uh, should be his joy. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I was muted. Uh, thank you so much, Khalil. Um, there are quite a few questions there. I don't know how many of them we can answer within uh, in the interest of time. I'll read from the first one. And please, uh, I'll appreciate it if you can be very brief so we can get to as many as possible. So the first one, actually, I, sum I summarize it, um, is kind of uh, questioning the possibility, the, the appropriateness of using the term Islamic Neoplatonism due, due to some historical dubiousness. Uh, what's your thought on this? Um, I, I, I use it in a contingent way um, it, among, I would rather rebrand it as hikma, for example, like, you know, I would just call it hikma, like internally, but I use it because 
to when I say it to to a non-Muslim or even many Muslims today, hikmah, they just don't know what that means. Um, Neoplatonism, which is a Western created term, just seems to be more precise given the context we live in. Uh, I'm happy to rebrand in in whatever suggested form uh, people have. I'm but I'm just using it the term contingently because I've tried to to sort of sell this model of reality to other philosophers of religion, like I'm sure Professor Maysami, you have also done, been doing the same, right? Articulating this worldview to, to sort of non-Muslim philosophers today. And I have not found the right label uh, yet for this. So yeah, I, I'm not married to the Islamic Neoplatonism <laughs> uh, label, but I'm just using it right now as, as you know, provisionally. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, the second question is, uh, um, according to second question, the assumption that simplicity slash unity of God um, means that God cannot have other attributes seems problematic to the person who has asked the question. Um, uh, the simplicity is subjective. Uh, to those who understand that it is simple, uh, says he says that I also question the assumption that God could not have created other than this. This is a creation because um, um it, it, whatever go, it's going on well i can't have problem reading this line sure. uh, it's a test according to the quran yes that uh, quite that it is told in the quran that it is for testing and that is why there is evil and satan so um what would you like to say sure so okay i think firstly there's some um confusion over the term simplicity okay so, so i'm using simplicity the way philosophers of religion use the term so simplicity here means the lack of any internal or external boundaries that's what simplicity means here so i'm well, i don't mean simplicity in like the epistemic sense of oh this is so simple to understand that's not what i'm talking about i mean god does not have any parts right there are no internal boundaries or parts or components or aspects within god there is no real differentiation within God. Uh, this is what Tawheed is, as far as I understand it. And um, we can logically show that God must be simple. Uh, if God is not simple, it would mean that within God, there's one aspect, and then there's another aspect that are not identical. Uh, and then once you have that, you need to ask the question, these two non-identical aspects within God are they both absolutely independent or does one depend on the other or are they both dependent on something else? If they're both, if both these aspects within God are absolutely independent, then you actually have two absolutely independent realities, which is polytheism. If one of those aspects within God actually depends on the other and the other is absolutely independent, then you have only one absolutely independent reality, and that's the true God, and that other aspect is not really God, it's a dependent reality. If you said both of these aspects within God, which are not identical, are both dependent on one another, then both of them depend on something beyond themselves, and that, that reality they depend on would be God. Uh, so... The, uh, we have rational arguments for why God is non-composite in this sense. And uh, for anyone interested, I actually debated uh, a Salafi last week on YouTube on this very topic. And I've offered both Quranic and rational arguments on why God must be non-composite. So that's what I mean by simple, right? I mean, absolute oneness, non-composite. Um, the rest of what you said here, God could not have created other than this. I didn't get, you're right, I didn't get into it, but very quickly. Uh, basically, if God is simple, within God, you don't have a menu of possible creations that he could do within God. If God is absolutely simple, there's only one creative possibility that God can do, which is what he actually did. Uh, and either that one creative possibility that God does, it's either a perfect creation or it's an imperfect creation. If it's an imperfect creation, if God actually makes an imperfect creation, it would mean that he created something imperfect, but logically, it was possible for God to make something more perfect than what he actually did. And yet he failed to create something more perfect. And if God fails to create something that is possible for him to create, then something prevented God from creating what he had the potential to do. And if something prevents God from creating what is most perfect, then there's a limitation uh, on God, which we would have to reject. 
So be that, because that's an absurdity, the only logical uh, conclusion that I've come to is that God necessarily creates a perfect creation. I hope that Thanks. addresses some of that. Thanks. Uh, next question. I wonder how you address the traditional critique of Neoplatonic model of emanation as positing a God without will, a God from whom things emanate almost automatically. Okay, very good question. So it's not a God without will. It is a God without libertarian will right? Libertarian will is a will that picks from a menu of choices, and it picks something for no prior reason or cause, okay? That's libertarian will. A libertarian will is a divine will that is completely self-determined. It's not even affected by God's own essence. That's a libertarian type of will. Metaphysically, this leads to a ton of problems. It actually leads to brute contingency. So let's say you have a libertarian God and he could pick between A and B, okay? He could pick A or he can pick B. Now, a libertarian will would say God picked A, but he still could have picked B. And if you ask, why did God pick A instead of B? The answer would be just because. There's no reason for it. Now, in a libertarian God, God picking A is a contingent choice, okay? It's a contingent choice. It didn't have to happen. God picking B is a contingent choice. And if you ask, what is the cause for God contingently picking A, a libertarian model would say there is no cause. He just did it. We don't know why, but he just did it. The problem with this is that a libertarian model of God means there is a contingent reality, God picking A, which is uncaused. And if you believe in a contingent reality that is uncaused, well, then you could be an atheist because an atheist can say the universe is contingent and it doesn't need a cause. So if you reject brute contingency, the only model that you should take is a model of a divine will where the divine will is determined by the divine essence. And in this case, the divine will is contingent in itself, but it's necessitated by God. That's the type of model that Ibn Sina has that Sijistani has, and so on. So that's why it's not a God without will. It is a God without a libertarian will, but a libertarian will leads to brute contingency. So I reject a libertarian divine will, and I go for a divine will that is determined by the divine self. And if you think about it, an agent whose action is determined only by their own self that is a truly free agent. So I would say the Neoplatonic God is actually a true free agent. And the libertarian God is a random number generator. Okay, well, we are bombarded by so many good questions. Uh, I think we have time only for one in the order of the appearance of questions. I have Dr. Farouk here. So I'll give the last, but unless he wants to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should probably try to give it up because it's going to take, a, like yesterday, this thing takes okay. some time. But I'll actually, but I still want to mention it because, but I'll be very brief. So when you you, you provided us with this emanation scheme, so uh, we have the universe, which is not perfect because it's a creation of the universal soul, which in, in, in turn emanates from the first intellect and then, and, and, and then which in turn comes from God. And then we have the, you know, emanation scheme, which continues. So in this picture, it does seem like uh, the, you know, God is kind of completely removed from what's going on. And I wonder it leads us back to the uh, problem of evil that you described at the beginning, which is that God is omniscient, or, or he's supposed to be omniscient, he's supposed to be perfect, he's supposed to be all powerful, and yet there is evil, and it's contradictory. Why is he not doing anything? So if he, we have this scheme, does this not render God powerless? Like universal soul is God's creation. And from this, there is imperfection in the world and so forth. And yet we have a God, but he's not even in the picture. So this so, did not, okay. not make things more complicated. So I, I think that, I mean, to, to interpret the Neoplatonic model as taking God out of the picture, uh, I think it is a complete misinterpretation of it. Uh, because we need to remember that uh, God, if, if the universal intellect is like a bright light bulb, and the universal soul is, an, is another light bulb, it's less bright, and the cosmos that we inhabit is a whole bunch of light bulbs, which are less bright, okay? In this model, God is the power source, 
okay? And God's command, kun, is the electricity. So one thing we need to remember within this Neoplatonic system is that this divine act of will that you see up here, it's within the first intellect, okay? But that divine act of will is a electric current. It's an ontological current that's flowing through the whole system, okay? So the creative power of every uh, cause, every cause's creative power is being supplied by God, right? The reason why we have evil or deficiency happening downstream is that these causes, right, they have, they're, they're being powered by God, but in terms of the form of the effect that each cause can produce, that's where you have a limitation. Uh, and the root source of this, the reason why you have this limitation, it goes back to the fact that only God can create a perfect being, right? These other creations, because they're not God, they cannot create a perfect being. So the, as, as you go down the stream, right, every light bulb will get less bright. So again, the, this whole system is not a clockmaker type God. That would, because God is eternal. His creative action of making the first intellect is eternal. The first intellect is eternally emanating the soul. The soul is eternally emanating everything under it. And this whole eternal process is being powered or supplied by the divine word kun, be. So God is not removed from anything. There is, like Ibn Arabi would say, there, because Ibn Arabi also believes in the concept of God's command. He calls it the, the breath of the all merciful, right? So just like in the electricity example I gave you, that current is flowing through all the bulbs, Right? Even though you can't see the current in and of itself, you only see the current as it manifests in a particular light bulb, whether it's, it's bright or not. But that electric current is the divine act, and that is in everything. Uh, so God is always in control, and God is intimately present by virtue of his creative act.